of introduction. And we're into a short series, uh, chapters 4 to 7 of the book of the Revelation together over the next few weeks. I just feel that the Lord has led me here to preach on this, uh, to help me understand the book better. It's always good if you want to learn something, try and teach it. That's how you learn things. Uh, That's what I find anyway. So I'm being driven by the Lord to get my hands on the book of the Revelation and to understand it better. So he's leading me to teach through the next few chapters. I mean, I think most people can get through chapters 1 to 3 of Revelation quite easily. It's not too bad. Chapters 4 and 5 aren't too bad either. It's whenever you get into the rest of the book that we're getting into trouble. And um, so that's why I'm taking a stab at this together over the next while. And we live in evil times. We live in sinful times and Christians who have their eyes open can see it's getting worse. But Jesus did say that, uh, you know, until the harvest, the gospel and evil will grow together. He said, let both grow together until the harvest. So as we're looking out, we shouldn't be too pessimistic. Yes, the world is increasingly evil, but the gospel is increasingly spreading. People are being saved all over the world. Uh, The internet is a great source of evil. It's also a great source of salvation to millions. It's opening up doors to people all over the world. So both are growing together. Uh, The gospel and evil will continue to grow until the end of of the age. But we do live in evil times and we live in uncertain times. And as we look out and uh, as we watch the news, we know that the world we live in seems to be an absolute mess. It seems to be a chaotic, pointless, aimless mess. Is it all a mess? Is it all chaos? And is that all there is? Is it out of control? These are the questions that many are asking. What's it all about? There's wars and rumours of wars every time we put on the television. There's threats of famine, reports of famine, uh, there's fear, there's disease. Whatever you think about COVID, it was a worldwide thing that closed the world down. And Jesus did say that there will be pestilences in the last days. Some people want to deny uh, these things. I don't want to deny them. I want to receive them. Jesus said these things will happen. Okay, we've just come out of a pandemic, whatever you want to call it, but it closed down the world. And Jesus said these things will be happening as we come to the end. But he says the end isn't yet. And these things need to be taken into account, but the end isn't yet, said the Lord. Whenever you see these things, there's more to come. There's more to come. Um, Is it out of control? Is it a meaningless mess? Is that what it's all about? Is it a painful, hurtful pointless chaos. Is that what this life is? I don't know if you're struggling this morning and if you're looking out with and you're struggling with depression or whatever and inside it's dark and then you look out and it's dark and you're wondering is there any hope? I mean I feel like I'm a mess inside personally and then you might look out at the world and you say there's nothing to live for. There's nothing to live for in this mess. It's a painful, hurtful, pointless chaos. And many people come to the conclusion there's no rhyme or reason or point to it all anyway. And suicide's on the, on the rise. And people have no hope. And young people are taking their life. Many, many young people are just saying no future and no way out. And they just say, the best thing I can do is look for a rope. And Revelation, it's a scary book to some. It's a closed book to many. But for me, every time I read it, It's a book of encouragement, and it's a book of hope, and it's a book that points us to life. Yes, there's judgment, but at the end there's life and there's a way through. So, is death just going to swallow us all up and that's that? Is that that what the story's all about? Is that how the story ends for us all as individuals? We all die and get put into the ground, and that's that. And is that the story for humanity? That's the story for each individual, that's it, death's the end and that's it. And then is that the story for humanity? Like all humans will one day just die and the the whole human race will go extinct and that's it. We all die. Get on with it. So the book of the Revelation is largely aimed at discussing things like this and answering questions like this and giving hope in the dark especially to believers, because the book opens with Jesus Christ speaking uh, a word to seven churches. And they're dealing with all sorts of problems and all sorts of uh, uh, burdens are on them and difficulties that they're facing. And the book of the Revelation was originally writ to these people in this historic time. And it means something to them. It means something to us right now in the present. And it has words for the church for the future. 
It's forever speaking. The book of the Revelation is always speaking. But it was given to speak mainly, I would say, to believers, the seven churches, and us included, who are facing darkness, who are facing martyrdom, who are facing persecution and evil. They're facing attacks of temptation, just to sin and go lukewarm and be apathetic to Jesus and just be half-hearted, half-baked about their Christianity. And the book of the Revelation is written to people like that. Also to people who are threatened with the lure of the world. It's always there, calling us away from the church. And God reminds us at the outset of two vital truths in the book of the Revelation. He says the first vision is really a vision of the risen Christ. We're not going to read that, but uh, the vision of the risen Christ. And then we've got the vision of the, the throne. And that's the two things, before we go any further, that when we're dealing with darkness and evil and persecution, and when it's dark inside you, and when it's dark in the world around you, these are the two visions that we really need to get. Jesus is alive. The risen Christ. There's a throne in heaven, occupied. We're going to come back to that in a minute. But these are the things we need to hold on to. Jesus is risen, God's on the throne. When it's dark, when it's difficult, when you don't want to go on, when you're tempted by sin, when the world's saying, give up all this Christianity, when all of this is going on, Jesus is risen. It's true. Christianity's true. Okay? And God's on the throne. As dark as it is, God's on the throne, and he's bringing us all through. So be encouraged and don't fear is the message of the book and stay strong and persevere. Keep going. That's mainly what the book is doing, giving us hope in the darkness. God's with us. He's among us. Jesus was walking among the, the seven lampstands at the start of the book and that shows us that Jesus cares about his church and he's with us as we do this gospel work and as we live for him, God is with us. He's among us. He's aware of our struggles. Whatever you're struggling with, Jesus knows about it. He's walking among the lampstands at the start of the book, alive and glorified and risen. And then not only is God with us and he's among us, the revelation shows us God is above us, sovereign, in control, not chaos, plan, purpose, direction. He's enthroned. He's sovereign. And we always need reminding of this. We have a risen Savior and we have a sovereign God. Eternal, glorious, <coughs> holy, sovereign God. That's what they sing about in this chapter in a minute. He's holy. He's almighty. He's glorious. He's sovereign. He's the creator of everything and he's in control. We worship this God. So this world is not in chaos this morning. That's what I want to just say and encourage you and remind you about. This world is not in chaos. It's moving exactly to God's time scale. It, God isn't surprised by what's going on. We're surprised. We don't know the future, but God's all knowing. He's omniscient. He knows everything. And he's not surprised. And he's bringing it to the conclusion he has determined for the whole lot. Nothing is happening in the world and nothing is happening in your life that is a surprise to God this morning. And he can bring you through. And he will. So let's, let's read Revelation 4. It's not the longest of chapters. And let's read it together. After this, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, that's the voice of Jesus. You read about it in chapter 1. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit and behold a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne 
On each side of the throne are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying... Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. That's God's word to us this morning. We've been brought right into God's throne room here. <clears throat> and it's an amazing thing, and we're going to break it down maybe over the next couple of weeks. And um, I want to say this at first. An open door in heaven. Uh, John looks and there's an open door in heaven. A door, he says, standing open in heaven. That's what he saw in verse 1. And I just wrote here, wow, he's seen an open door in heaven. And heaven's doors open to John here in the vision. And he's invited up. And the voice that invites him up is Jesus. And we think, some people don't like using the word lucky. It's a turn of phrase. How lucky is John? How blessed is he? The world uses that word lucky. We can use it and you'll forgive me. How lucky is this man to get up there and to see what he's about to see? And he, the door opens in heaven for him and Jesus calls him up. And then I was thinking about this and I just says, well, that's just what happens to every Christian. Might not be directly in the text here and what the Apostle John wants to be preached from this, but it's just what happens to every Christian, really. There's a door open in heaven and Jesus is the voice that calls us to come through it. And if you're not a saved Christian yet this morning, if you've never heard the voice of Jesus calling you to come into God's presence and to live with him forever, if you've never heard that, I want to say to you, Jesus is calling you. Only the voice of Christ, only responding to his voice can you enter heaven. Jesus Christ said, I am the door. By me, if you enter in, you'll be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes through the Father. No one gets through that door into heaven except by me. And it's all at response to his voice. Jesus says that he's died for us. He's covered all our sins on the cross. And when we trust in him, Jesus says, there's a door open for you today. Would you go through the door? That's the first thing I want to ask. Would you go through the door? Jesus is calling you. Would you enter in through this door and be saved? Would you allow Christ to save you and give up all your own efforts? Because what John did, he couldn't get himself through that door. God had to take him through it. And you can't take yourself to heaven. Whatever you do, God's going to have to take you there. He's going to have to open the door and make it possible for you to be saved and bring you right in. And it's by faith that we're saved. Christ has opened the door of heaven for you. And Christ calls all of us. Just as similar to how he calls John here. Come up. Come to me. All ye who, who labor and are heavy burdened and I'll give you rest. Jesus Christ is calling to everyone. He's calling to you. If you've never heard his voice, I want to say to you. If you're hearing it this morning. Jesus Christ is offering you entrance to heaven. There's a door standing open. But you know when we die, the door closes. When Christ returns, the door closes shut. There's no more time. There's no more door open. And it's a great, gracious thing to see. There's an open door in heaven for you. But I'm pleading with you this morning. Make sure you get through it. Earlier in the text, uh, in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus, he says this. This is, this is the image he gives us as he talks to the church there in Laodicea. Look at verse 20. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is Christ now standing at the metaphorical door of individual human hearts. The door of the church. But he's speaking to individuals because he says, um, If anyone, any individual, Revelation 3.20, If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and eat with him, and he with me. Jesus here is offering personal fellowship with God. He's saying, I'm knocking at the door of your heart. 
I'm telling you what I've done for you. I've died on the cross for all your sins. I'm telling you there's an open door in heaven. But first you have to open the door of your heart. Each individual has to open the door of their heart to Jesus Christ. And he says, you know what? If you open your door, I won't stand outside and accuse you and judge you and reject you. When I see you face to face and you open that door, many people think when they come face to face with God, what he's going to do is he's going to get them. God says, Jesus says, well, if you hear my voice and you open that door, I'm going to come in and eat with you. I'm going to come in and have a relationship with you. Because it's by responding to my voice that I can forgive your sins. And we can have a relationship. And Jesus says this morning, if you're not saved, I stand at the door and knock. And if you hear my voice, you make sure to open the door. Because I'm for you. I want to save you. I love you. Don't be afraid of entering into that door that's open in heaven for you. It's going to close one day. So if you want to enter heaven, you need to respond to Jesus. And when he knocks at the door of your life, open the door. Make sure you get in. And the voice says this, <clears throat> what it says to John then, he says further, he says, After this, says John, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, this is the voice of Christ, which I heard speaking to me like at, at first. It was like a trumpet, he says. The voice says, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this at the end of verse 1. He says, come up here. Jesus says, come up here, John, and I'm going to show you some things that must take place after this. And that word stuck out to me like a sore thumb as I was preparing this, and God was leading me just to slow down here and just to take out this word, must. The book of the Revelation isn't uh, God hopes it's going to happen. God on the balance of probability, God might get this thing done. It's not like that. It's not possibly, probably, hopefully. God's word is certain. And he says, I'm going to show you what must take place after this. These things are going to happen. Okay? God says to John, these things are going to happen. History isn't aimless. It's not a matter of probability if this is going to happen. Jesus is alive. The end is certain. God's working all things together for good for those who love him. And the word says that God watches over his word to perform it. God watches over his word to perform it. That means God keeps his promises. That means if God promises something and he says something must happen, it's going to happen. This isn't, hopefully, this isn't like, people look at the book of the Revelation, and because it's difficult to understand, they think it's airy-fairy, symbolism. Who knows what this means? Well, I'll tell you what, whatever it means, it's going to happen. Whatever the book's saying, it's going to happen. That's what, it, that's what it means. The book of the Revelation is certain to be fulfilled. Jesus always talked like this. He said the scriptures must be fulfilled as he was going to the cross. Not I'm trying to do it. I hope to do it. He's saying the scriptures must be fulfilled. When God speaks, it's going to happen. When God promises something, you can bank on it. And I uh, was thinking about the book of the Revelation when I, said, when, I, when I thought about this verse. You know, what does he mean here? The things, the things that must take place after this. Well, it's everything else in the book. That's what's going to take place. That's what God's promising here to John. I'm going to show you some stuff that's going to happen. God's plans must happen. The scriptures must be fulfilled. The wrath and judgment of God on this world must happen. Must. The Lord Jesus must personally and visibly return for the church. Must. The devil and all demonic evil must be judged and must be cast into a bottomless pit and eventually the lake of fire. That's where he's going. Must. The devil must be judged. The entire human race must be judged at the great white throne judgment. We must all appear, says the New Testament, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It's a must. The old cursed creation, fallen because of sin, must give way to a new heaven and a new earth. Must. The curse must be lifted. The old order of things must give way to the new. This is what the book's all about. Tears, all tears, must be wiped away forever by Jesus. Pain, suffering and death itself must, must be done away with. Justice, 
Perfect justice must be done. Peace, perfect eternal peace must arrive. God's kingdom must come. God's will must be done on earth as it is in heaven. The Lord's prayer must be answered. And that's what the whole book's about too. This is the answer to the Lord's prayer. The book of Revelation is showing us, you know that prayer that Jesus gave you to pray? It's going to be answered. Our Father in heaven, enthroned in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and so it will. God's name will be hallowed and glorified. Thy kingdom come, and so it will. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, so it will. That's a prayer that's going to be answered. And that's why the Lord says to John, I'm going to show you what must take place after this. All of these things are certain and they're going to happen. <clears throat> and now, chapter 4 is full of loads of interest and stuff. And before we go much further and proceed down with the details and stuff, um, we could miss uh, a big massive point that the chapter is trying to tell us. I've been banging on about it, a bit about it already. But before we get into questions, you see, and there's loads of, I'm sure as you were reading it there, that you were wondering, what's this? What's this about? What's that about? I mean, before we get into all these questions about, is the open door a symbol of the rapture of the church? Is that what that's about? Uh, who are the 24 elders? Is it the church or is it angels? What's these four loving creatures all about? We could get into all sorts of side journeys here this morning. What's the lion and the ox and the human and the eagle all about there? What are the colours, these jewel-like colours, uh, the glory of God here? What's that all about? Is there any significance in the colours of this? What's the crystal sea all about? What's that doing there? What's the emerald green rainbow doing around the throne? Is it a full rainbow? Is it a halo? Is it vertical? Is it horizontal? What does it mean? And we can get into all sorts of questions here and so on. We'll look at some of these next week. But today we want to see the big important truth, and it's this. There is a throne in heaven. Don't miss the throne, because you're looking at the, the feet of these animals, or you're looking at whatever's going on, the colours and so on. And all that's good, and you must hold the whole vision together and see it. But don't miss the throne. Don't miss that there's a throne in heaven. And someone's occupying it. There's someone sitting on the throne as we speak. Don't miss it. God's on the throne. And this is so important. God's on the throne. And here's the thing. It's someone sitting on the throne. There's someone in control. It's not like the atheist and the, and the scientist will tell us that, you know what's ruling the universe? It's just forces. It's just molecules. And molecules and forces don't care about you. But we have a heavenly father, a creator God. It's a personal throne. There's someone sitting on the throne. There's a, it's personal. God has feelings. God has plans. And here we are reminded that there's a person on the throne. We have a loving heavenly father on the throne, Christian. You're not at the mercy, like the evolutionists will tell you, just of time, chance, and matter. There's a throne above and... Your Heavenly Father is sovereign and in control of this universe. There's a supreme plan for all things. Evolution says it's aimless and random. Revelation says there's a plan because there's a throne and there's someone sitting on it. And he's not stupid. And this whole thing is, is happening for reasons and for purposes and it's got a name. He has a name in sight. So the implication of this is this, that your life isn't pointless. If there's a throne and there's a heavenly father who loves you, he has a plan. So there's a plan for your life. You're more than just molecules. And I want to speak to any young person who might just be, by God's providence, watching this. I want to say, there's a point to your life. You're not just an animal. You're not just a collection of molecules. There's a throne in heaven and there's a heavenly father in heaven above. And he has a plan for your life. And he plans to save you. He plans to forgive you all your sins. He has a plan to live with you forever if you'll trust him. He has a plan to give you eternal life and a future and a hope. Don't listen to what your teacher tells you or what the scientist tells you. There's a throne in heaven and a loving father occupies the throne. Now if God's on the throne, the second thing that we don't want to miss this morning is it means this. We're all accountable. Throne speaks of sovereign king, laws and a kingdom rules, government. God's on the throne. And I want to say this morning, there's a higher throne than every earthly throne. 
There's a higher government than every earthly government. You're not king. God is king. Even the king on earth isn't king. God's king. Every authority is delegated authority. And heaven rules. And the point is this. How does this make any difference to me? Sitting on my seat in Castle Derg this morning, Mark, why are you telling me this? Well, because you can't safely ignore the throne. There's a king. There's a king's law. There's a way of doing things. He's moral. He loves, he loves holiness. He hates sin. This is the throne. It's a holy throne. And this authority is greater than your authority. You can't just shake your fist at this throne and say, to hell with your laws, I'll do it my way. Because there's a throne in heaven. And the governments and every king on earth will give an account to heaven's king. And at the feet of heaven's throne. And so will you and I. And every time I thought about this this week, the word accountability was just coming to me. Because there's a throne in heaven, you're accountable. I'm accountable. And that's the problem. Because if God holds us accountable for our sin, and if his laws are going to be upheld, I've broken them all. I'm in trouble. When I come before this throne and this king and he says, well, how did you get on with my laws, with my kingdom rules? How did you get on, Mark? And I'll say, terrible. I broke every one of them. I didn't love you. I didn't really love you the way I should. For many years I ignored you. I thought I was the king. Terrible. I broke nearly every rule in your book. So accountability is being preached here. And the whole world acts like it's not accountable. You look at the world and they just think, we're not accountable. We can kill babies. We can have our own sexual morality how we like. Sleep with who we want, when we want, wherever we want. Do it our way. We can live life our way. And Revelation 4 says, no, you can't. And that's a, that's a, it's a serious thing to come to terms with, that there's a throne above and we're all accountable. And here's the thing. It's a holy throne. It's a holy throne. And we will all give an account. But I just wrote here this morning, there is a throne, there is a holy throne, Thank God there's also a bloody cross. Because if we stand before the holy throne, we're done for. But if we get our hands on and cling to the bloody cross of Christ that forgives us our sins and our failures, we can stand before the holy throne because there's a bloody cross. Have you been to the bloody cross before you go to the holy throne? You need to. Because it's at the bloody cross where you get your sins forgiven. It's at the bloody cross where you're set free and where you can then know that you can stand before this throne that we're all accountable to. And the final thing about this throne in heaven this morning is this. God's sovereign on the throne. And it does mean that there's a plan. We touched upon it earlier. We're accountable. It's personal throne. There is a plan and a purpose. It's not chaotic. Evil will not win. And I want to say this. The third thing is this to say, have you been anxious as you look out at the news? Have you been fearful? Have you even been doubting God? You're looking at the news and going, there's so much evil in the world. How could there be a God? I'm talking to Christians. The devil will be so bold as to tempt a Christian to think there's no God. He'll give it a go. He'll test you out. He'll poke you and see what you're made of, won't he? And you're looking out at the world and you're looking out at... Hamas and the evil that's happening in Israel and all the innocent victims on both sides of a conflict like that. Children on both sides are being killed. And you're looking at this and all the pain and the tears and you're going, is this, is this right? Is this Bible true? Well, evil won in the end. And I want to remind you that this throne preaches to us, the Bible's true. Jesus said this, he said, In this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. This is the message of the throne this morning. How do we respond to it? I want to just bring us to the end of the chapter and point this out to us. God showed me this. How do we respond to the holy throne? How should we? And we should go to uh, verse 9. 
And it's all about worship, you see, and the, the appropriate response to the throne is your surrender and worship. Let's get to the point, okay? Your surrender and worship. The four loving creatures, they worship God. Uh, in verse 8, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, who was and is, is to come. They worship him. They worship him because of who he is, okay? And then the 24 elders, they worship God, verse 11, because of what he has done. He's the creator. He said, they say, Worthy are you, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. We should worship God because of who he is, holy, almighty, eternal, and he's the creator of everything. And we can jump over to chapter 5, and we can say we should worship God because it says here, Worthy are you, speaking of Jesus, to take the scroll and open its seals. Why should we worship God? For you were slain. And by your blood you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you've made them a kingdom and priests to our God. And they shall reign on the earth. This is why we should worship God. This is our response to the throne this morning. You want to worship Jesus. You want to worship the creator, the holy, almighty, eternal God. He's mighty. He's magnificent. He's awesome. And we've just read about the throne room and we're going to go through it next week. And he died for us. He shed his blood. You ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And I feel like saying this, in Northern Ireland we need to open our eyes a bit wider. Okay? God's a God of all the nations. He's going to save people from every nation and tongue and tribe. But it's not a God of the, the Unionist and the Protestant in Northern Ireland. Open your eyes. Okay? This is the God of the whole nations. He's the God who created the whole thing. He created all things, and by his will they existed and were created. And he's the saviour of all people. He loves the world. Northern Ireland, wake up, is what I would say about this. Wake up to who God is, and how we should be worshipping him. And reaching out to people in love. With meekness and respect, says Peter. Wake up. This is the throne that we're all going to stand before and give an account to. The appropriate response is found in verse 9 of, of chapter 4 where it says this, And whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, this is what they do, they fall down before the throne, they fall down before him who is seated on the throne, and they worship him who lives forever, and they cast their crowns before the throne people. Do you hear me? They get off their throne, and they cast their crown. That's the response to God's throne this morning that Jesus is asking you for. Vacate your throne if you're not a Christian. And cast your crown if you're not a Christian. Get off your throne. Vacate your throne like the 24 elders do. And cast your crown. This is repentance and surrender. This is giving God who's worthy his worth. This has given him what he deserves, is our surrender, our repentance, and our hearts. Humility is required. Satan said in Isaiah 14 that many people think that this verse applies to Satan. He said, I'm going to set my throne above in the heavens. I will ascend. I'm going to set my throne higher than God's throne. I'll set my throne on high, and that's the heart of every sinner. We don't want to get off our throne. We want to rule. We want to keep our little crowns on our heads and we want to sit on our little thrones and our dominion and we want to be in control and we want to rule our life and tell Jesus where to go and tell God where he can take his rules and his living and his advice and all that he gives us beautiful things things that help us the law of God's good and we tell God you can take it and stick it because I'm on the throne and I'm king or queen in my life and Jesus says if you try to keep your life you lose it if you lose your life to me you find it. If you try to keep your crown, you're going to lose it. If you cast your crown to me, you'll find it. You'll find out what life's all about. You'll find out who I am. If you're not a Christian today, I want to invite you to do what these guys did, these elders did in the vision. They got off their throne and they cast their crown. Surrender to Jesus. Surrender to Christ. It's like in Jonah... The king got off his throne and he repented in sackcloth and ashes. Repentance is always an image of you giving up control in your life to Jesus Christ. You surrendering authority to him. Crown speaks of authority. And we must admit Jesus, 
you're in control. Jesus, you're king. Jesus, you're Lord. Jesus, you're my saviour. And by faith, we trust him. By faith, we get off our thrones and we cast our crowns. And I want to ask you, have you ever done that? Has there ever come a point in your life when you've come to Jesus and you've said, Lord, I've blew it. I'm a sinner. But thank you that I see that you died for me. Thank you that you rose again from the dead for me. Thank you that you're in control. Thank you that there is a plan for my life. Thank you that there is a heaven up ahead. Thank you that you're inviting me to come through the open door. Now, Lord, I want to get off my throne and cast my crown, and I want to follow Jesus this morning. I want to invite Jesus into my life. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess eventually that Jesus Christ is Lord. But what we need to do today, and what you need to do, is to be saved as this. You need to bow the knee now. You need to confess Christ as Lord now. Right now. Let's pray.